The following is the content of an email that I sent to Hassel on November 25, 2015. I included a few other people in the mailing list. The OHO assessment team, Paula Kimball from the coroner's office. Tom Robertson, Olivia Bigold, Wakefield, Duggan, Michael Walsh, Bill Kingswell, the health minister, the executive group at CHQ, the CHQ board, patient experience at Lady Salento, Julia Clayton, the police commissioner and Ross Pinkerton. Not one person had a word to say about any of it, jellyfish, the lot of them. It turns out that Hassel's actions were more devious than I had characterized them, but that is fodder for another story. Dr. Hassel, I remain unclear about the issue of the unblinded diagnostic opinions that were eventually sought in regard to Claire's tumor. Tannenberg's opinion suddenly appeared, despite you consistently refusing to progress requests for opinions. This coincided with our threat of legal action to compel your compliance, and with Ross Pinkerton's meeting with us to discuss the issues. During that meeting, Pinkerton advised us that it was unlikely that any pathologist would supply a blind opinion. Robertson has since confirmed that it is not uncommon for blind opinions to be supplied, which throws doubt onto Pinkerton's statement. So why did he say what he said? The application of Occam's razor seems appropriate. Pinkerton had spoken to you before speaking to us. He was already aware that you intended to comply with our request for second opinions. In fact, he quite probably instructed you to do so. But you told him, or indicated to him, your intention to invalidate the opinions or use them to your own ends, by ensuring that they supported your diagnosis and treatment approach. This also goes some way to explaining Pinkerton's further comment to the effect that when parents push, sometimes clinicians push back, you were being forced to do something that you did not want to do, and so you intended to do whatever was required to make the exercise pointless, or to use it to Claire's detriment. Pinkerton's utterances were probably the result of him being in possession of knowledge that he was uncomfortable with, and either tried to offer us a warning of sorts, or else it was some kind of Freudian slip. So, what did you do to pervert the opinions Dr. Hassel? Did it involve a quiet chat with Tony Tannenberg, with whom you had previously worked, who then supplied a very strange opinion that eviscerated Robertson in his original diagnosis? Did you direct Robertson to supply Ellison's opinion to each of the second opinion providers, believing that this would be influential enough to ensure that each opinion came back favoring your chosen diagnosis and treatment approach? The deeper issue, though, is why you resisted second opinions for as long as you did. Occam can answer this quite effectively too. Second opinions are available as of right to patients and families. This being the case, there can be no valid reason why a clinician should object or stand in the way of second opinions being sought. The purpose of the second opinion is to test the validity of the diagnosis and the treatment following from it. On what basis would a clinician seek to prevent second opinions from occurring? Ego is arguably the most likely. Some doctors like to see themselves as being infallible. For such individuals, the possibility of being disagreed with, or being found diagnostically wanting, is too much of a threat. Is this a likely reason for you preventing opinions being sought? Absolutely. Is it justifiable? Absolutely not. From here, though, the reasons get darker and much more unconscionable. However, consideration of them is unavoidable. A doctor might want to prevent a second opinion from occurring if he knows or suspects that he has made a diagnosis that is not justified by the available evidence, or is contrary to the opinions of colleagues and team members, or that has been made on the basis of a limited data set that is in conflict with the preponderance of the evidence, or that has been made for malign reasons. Do any of these reasons apply to you, Dr. Husserl? I would argue that they do. 
perhaps all of them, and not one of them can be remotely justified. Regardless, there is incontrovertible evidence that the opinions, once it was clear that they had to be sought, were willfully unblinded. It remains unclear precisely how this occurred, but that it occurred is uncontested, and that it was deliberate, and in complete opposition to our clearly stated requests, is evident. It takes a special kind of ego to take such unconscionable and unprofessional action to guard against the possibility of being found to have made a diagnostic error. In fact, it beggars belief that any clinician would bother. Is it so unacceptable to be seen to have human frailties that a doctor would risk a child's life in order to be seen to be diagnostically correct? I don't think so. Such action is much more likely to occur when a doctor understands that not only has he made a diagnostic error, but that he has also progressed the patient down a treatment path that has caused harm, and has resisted all efforts along the way to correct the error and bring appropriate treatments to bear. Does this apply to you, Dr. Hassel? Indeed, it does. And it gets worse. When you changed Claire's diagnosis on October 2, 2013, you told us that, Robertson, changed the diagnosis, yet you documented in the clinical file, in the last days of Claire's life, that GBM was not a diagnostic change, but merely a final diagnosis. When you could no longer prevent another team from considering Claire's diagnosis the Novo, because Juliet Clayton would not allow you to interfere in the process, you started covering your tracks with a file entry that foreshadowed the possibility of a return to the diagnosis of medulloblastoma, which you then suggested might require whole brain radiation. As Claire's life was ending, you suddenly saw the need to acknowledge the possibility that she might have had MB after all, the very thing that you had refused to acknowledge or to factor into treatment following the sudden and inexplicable diagnostic change on October 2, 2013. You knew all along that Robertson's diagnosis was at least as valid as Ellison's, but Ellison was a guru for you, and therefore, despite all other indications, you were going to be guided by Ellison's opinion, even if it was tentative, even if it was not supported by other evidence even though it was clearly stated that it must not be used for the purposes of final diagnosis, or as the sole tool for making a diagnosis. You must have known that once you started documenting Claire's diagnosis as GBM, she was as good as dead. You must have known that you would be triggering medical nihilism in your colleagues. And knowing that Claire most likely had a variant form of medulloblastoma, which responded well to radiation, you ensured that the treatment was insufficient to treat MB, despite our requests that you treat for both diagnoses. The coup de grace was in delaying Claire's access to a second round of radiation. You achieved this by failing to hospitalize Claire which would have given her access to radiation treatment within 48 hours of admission and by communication with Big Old, convincing or coercing her into ignoring our pleas for help. And then you watched us trying desperately to seek, in Melbourne, the treatments that you and Big Alt were delaying access to in Brisbane. I cannot reframe the facts as I understand them in a way that is more sympathetic to you, Dr. Hassel. It always works out the same way. You knew what you were doing. You killed Claire. Please show me where my facts and conclusions are incorrect. Some of what I said was speculation at the time. Since then, other information has come to light that provides much stronger motives for Hassel doing the things he did. Perhaps the most significant of these is the confirmation that Hassel did not have the right to make a unilateral change to Claire's diagnosis. He had very good reason for trying to prevent the matter from becoming contentious. He fought to defend the diagnosis that he had unlawfully imposed right up until we got Claire an appointment in Melbourne. He even unblinded the information sent to RCH Melbourne's pathologist. Despite Juliet Clayton requesting a blind sample being supplied, and despite, yet again, agreeing with me to arrange a blind tissue sample. 
if Hasul was acting in good faith, why would he do these things? Seriously, why?